Well, here we are with the Sears Silvertone model 6150. This is a 1939 set, all wood cabinet and complete. All of the trim and everything is in place and the uh, knobs, I'm not confident that these are original knobs, but anyway, and you can notice the, uh, let's get some light on it here so you can see, um, the uh, on off, since it's a battery set, it had a red flag that would tell you that your set was turned on, even if it was turned down. And then uh, uh, when you turn it off, it would go back to gold. The gold leaf cover uh, uh, dial is a little bit rough, but it had a silver in section here in the middle, kind of rubbed off probably from fingers. And uh, anyway, AM radio, um, like I said, nice cabinet and in pretty rough, uh, pretty good uh, physical shape, but needs some refinishing. I don't know that I'm going to even refinish it. I think I might just leave it all original. We'll see about that. Here's a uh, connections and placement of batteries diagram. And this radio uses two batteries, a 67 and a half volt battery and a four and a half volt battery. And I don't have either one of those, of course, because they don't even make those anymore. But I have a proper substitution and what we're going to discover if I'm not mistaken there's also another set of batteries in this radio and uh, we'll discover those when we get in there I won't uh, I won't do any spoiler alert uh, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, pull this chassis out there were two chassis two models that had two different intermediate frequencies. And this, this particular radio is a 1939 chassis um, and it uses the uh, 455 kilohertz or in the old days, 455 kilocycles intermediate frequency. And the other chassis was a 465 kilohertz intermediate frequency. And so they hadn't really standardized the uh, regenerative receiver intermediate frequencies at that time. And so they were bopping back and forth between 455 and 465 kilohertz. And so now um, uh, we, we've got a set here that's 455. Four tubes um, right here. We have the oscillator um, what they call an oscillator translator and it's basically an, an, an a, uh, um, amplifier uh, a, a, an amplifier for the antenna signal coming in and then they had an intermediate frequency tube and then they have a detector and the first amplifier first AF stage amplifier and then they finished with the output tube the uh, uh, audio output we have four wires here for the 40, uh, the 4.5 volt and the 67 volt battery. And we'll, I have no idea what wires go where just yet. So we're going to get into the set and find those where they go. Then we have the speaker wires here. We've got a ground wire that goes from the chassis internally to the frame of the speaker. And we talked a little bit about this speaker in a previous video but it's a rather unusual speaker. It's called a reed speaker. It doesn't use the spider coil like the, all the more modern speakers use. Instead, there are two magnetic coils right here, and they are wrapped around a set of uh, plates here, uh, magnetic plates, and a there's a shaft, a piece of wire right underneath this. This looks like an arrow right here. And right under here is a pin and it vibrates up and down on, uh, based on that coil magnetic field. And it toggles back and forth onto the speaker element. So I'm gonna tap it here and you can hear how loud it is. 
it, it acts like a lot like the old needles on the diaphragm uh, pickups on 78 um, RPM, you know, Victrolas. That's kind of the, the sense you get. And then here are the wire connections for these magnetic coils that are down here. So it's an unusual speaker. I've never had a reed speaker before, which is kind of a cool thing for me. All right, so we're not gonna do a full video on this. We're gonna pull the chassis out. We're gonna look at some of the things on the chassis and the electronics on the chassis. And then we're gonna look at that other battery thing that I was talking about that you may be familiar with or may not be familiar with. The guys that work on these all day, it's old hat stuff for them, but some of you technicians that are into more modern electronics, and I've got some buddies on ham radio that are technicians, I will be surprised if you have seen um, these other types of batteries. So let's, uh, let's get into it. I've got carpenter bee nests, mud, all over this knob where they've been building nests in there. And uh, so if I can get back in there without damaging something. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> Built their nests right in there. Probably you see some larva in here. Yeah, there's a bug or something. Dead bug for a bee larva or a wasp larva. Oh, well, whatever. Okay, so now this should just slide out after we take the chassis screws out. Got the model number right there, 6150. Three screws, one missing. There we go. All right, we're gonna need to disconnect the speakers. face. Let me show you what I did wrong here. Forgot about the needle here. Come on there. And I tore the face just a little bit. It's not good. You got a mouse nest in here. Right, let's uh, disconnect the speaker and ground. Let's take a look and see what we have here. Tuning condenser, as we called them in the old days. Volume control. There's the on and off indicator. This is the uh, antenna coil. Very fine wire. Hopefully it's not open. Lots of paper capacitors. Okay, now, here's what I wanted to show you. 
Do you recognize this? A lot of you guys have never seen this before. And that's why I want to take a little bit of time. You recognize all these resistors and capacitors, and I know you've, if you've worked on old stuff. But you may not have run into this. These are called bias cells. Bias cells. They are one volt batteries. Yes, they are batteries. And their purpose, the grid bias, I mean, the yeah, the grid bias cells are hooked to this tube, which is the output tube, the audio output tube, and they're hooked to the grid of the audio output tube. They put a negative bias on the tube, and the current that they draw is so negligible, it's almost non-existent, but it's enough to hold that tube grid negative, and it keeps it in its operating proper operating range. And so what they did was they put these these batteries, and these batteries are replaceable. Some guys, uh, I was doing some research about 10 years ago on these, and uh, some guys on, this is an 80-year-old radio, 83-year-old radio, but the they were actually put a meter on these, and they still had some residual voltage on them, if you can believe that. Um, so they they draw very, very little current on the uh, the grid of the output tube. So we're going to pop these open. We're going to pop these free. They're on a spring here. They're designed to be replaceable. So you can spread that spring open and pop these little button cells out. So that's what we're going to do. Um, let's see here. Let's take a couple of needle nose. I'm going to open this up and uh, let them pop out. Come on here, sugar bear. There they go. Okay. They fell out. Now they look pretty corroded, but um, what do you think? You think we could find one of these batteries at Walmart? <laughs> or Radio Shack, which virtually does not exist anymore. Yeah, so here we go. A couple of button cells. And what do you think? Pretty cool, huh? And what we're going to do, you reach over here, we're going to take a couple of these. Actually, I think these are 3 volt, but I have a whole bunch of uh, batteries over here. And we'll, uh, we'll substitute a couple of button cells. And um, we'll have to get the polarity correct. But we'll get these button cells put in here to replace these. And uh, we should be just fine. There's the retainer that holds those two little button cells. So let me show you. I think I can show you on the schematic. Sure, they're listed here somewhere. Um, there's the output tube, the audio output tube. You can see the speaker right there. Yeah, there's the bias cells right there on the grid. Okay. And you see the negative is on tied to the grid. Positive is um, ground in this case, but <clears throat> so you're getting a negative bias on the the uh, grid of the IG5G output tube. There's our 67 volt battery and our 4.5 volt battery with the power switch disconnecting both batteries to ground. So they switch the power onto chassis ground to fire up the battery. And uh, the uh, 
so it should be easy enough to be able to track down the wiring of which is the B battery and which one is the A battery. The B battery hooks directly to the positive side of B battery hooks directly to the speaker coil. So we'll just trace that down right now and then we'll identify it and uh, mark it as such. So let's go in here. The speaker, the power, the battery wires come in here, come down across the back of the, uh, or the side of the radio and then go in all different directions. So let's see if we can track that one down. Both of the ground wires, if you'll look again, let me take this. Both of the ground wire, or both leads, the positive of the A battery and the minus of the B battery go to the switch. So we should be able to find those two leads and identify those two leads. And here they are right here. Both of these leads tie right to the power switch. You can see that right there, the power switch. So those are the ground, well, not the ground, but one is a ground, one is a plus and one is a minus. Uh, the A battery is the plus and the B battery is the minus. So that black white stripe, I'm sure these were yellow. Yeah, they say they were yellow with a blue stripe, yellow with a black stripe, and then a red with a black stripe and a red with a just a red, solid red. Well, clearly, clearly the colors are gone and faded. So we can't go by colors anymore, can we? You can see the colors on inside the chassis, kind of, sort of. But, um, all right, let's, this cap is in my way. It's hard to see, really hard to see where everything's going. That's that black. Let's look at this blue one right here. This blue yellow. Yellow with the blue. Oh, that's the ground. See? Yellow and blue is A plus and it goes to the switch, which is switched to ground. So that's a switch wire. So this yellow with the black, which is this one right here. Where does it go? No telling. It's, oh, there it is, right there. And it comes over and touches the, the tube connection that is also connected to our bias cells. The tube side of the bias cells, you know, I think this even though there's a pin on that tube, I don't think that a that pin is used on this tube. And the reason I say that is because if you look here, there's the minus side, yellow and black, and it comes up, goes to a volume control connection, and it comes over and touches the positive side of the bias cell. Um, we've got a lead right in here that's the volume control that's this right here and that lead comes down and it touches the, the yellow and black wire somewhere, and it also touches the bias cell. So let's see, that black wire is right there. It touches the bias cell and the speaker, uh, volume control, excuse me, volume control. So let's see, are we even close? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. So that tells us that this black and yellow All right, so all we need to do is take the continuity tester and and let's just try I think 
I think it's this one. I don't know. We'll try it. Let's see if we're close. Okay, that's not it. All right, I'm on the uh, the other lead. All right, come on, let's keep looking here. That looks kind of like black yellow. Bingo. Okay, so there's our A battery minus. A battery minus. And the other dark, darker color striped wire is a switch to ground. So let's check that one. It should go to the switch. Yep, it does. All right, so we've identified the two A batteries. A battery minus, A battery minus, A battery plus. So let's mark these with the uh, label maker. My little Dymo is making noise, so there's my A minus, and let's uh, let's do an A plus here. Insert symbol plus print. So there's our A plus. All right, so let's double check this. We don't want to burn something up, do we? So we'll double check. We'll put the uh, continuity tester on one lead and figure out which one this was. It's either the ground or okay so it's a minus a minus a minus that's this circuit a minus goes up touches the volume control and the button cell so this is a minus Okay, there we go. A minus. And we'll double check. I know we checked this just a second ago. A plus. And we'll get the uh, power supply out here in a second. And I'll show you the different connections on the power supply. A plus. So now we've got the other two wires to contend with. And uh, you could have been a contender. All right, whatever. Little, <clears throat> very little humor there. All right, so we're going to grab one of these other wires and let's look at the schematic. Uh, one of these goes to the switch, which we just had for the A plus. And this will be, it could be B minus or B plus. So let's just double check and see if it's B minus. And it's not. So the other, so this is B plus. And B plus should go right up to a whole bunch of other stuff, but also should connect directly to the speaker coil wire. So if we grab the speaker coil wire, one of the speaker coil wires, we should have a, a beep. And we don't. 
well, what are we what are we doing wrong here? Um, maybe we got a broken wire too. Okay, we don't have a speaker coil wire. Yeah, because um, let's uh, let's see here. Comes up. Let's find a really easy. Goes to the IF transformer. Yeah, we should be red and blue. Oh, interesting. This is probably blue. No signal. No signal. No signal. Um, let's try the other wire. Maybe I'm... Okay, there we go. I just had the wrong wire. So this wire, hear the beep. This wire is our B, what do they say, B plus? Yeah, B plus. See, there's the battery lead. I know, I know. There's the battery lead. Goes up and, and goes directly to one of the speaker coils. So... Okay. And while we're at it, I'm going to mark this one as red. And so this is B plus. Oops, sorry about that. B plus. B plus, and then we know the other one is B minus, but we're going to confirm B minus should take us back to the on off switch, right? B minus over here to the on off switch. So let's verify that. And there it is. Okay. Yep. Okay. So this is B minus. So now we got our battery leads identified and it'll be very simple to hook the power up to these to these leads. So let's go get the uh, get the uh, battery eliminator. All right, I've got the vintage media museum and uh, I've got an old Atwater Kent radio here that I restored. Oops. My TV's coming on. Um, uh, let me turn that off. And the uh, Atwater Kent uses an external power supply, and right here it is. So we're going to grab this one and uh, come back here to the bench. 
And then I've got one more I want you to see. I showed in a previous video um, a uh, another power supply. Let me grab that one. Okay, Sela is out here helping. This is the uh, radiola that we worked on. And if you remember, we used the battery eliminator on it as well. And it's uh, right here. Come on here. Oh, power cord. So I'm not going to disconnect this one. But this is a really nice, this is about $140 power supply. It's kind of expensive, but you can see it's beautifully designed and built. It's got short circuit protection. It's got all these different voltages, 135 volts all the way down to minus 22 volts and everything in between. So we're not going to disconnect this one because there's a whole lot more wires connected to it. But that's what you need to work on these radios unless you want to build um, unless you want to build uh, your own power supply out of batteries so all right so let's get uh, let's get this one right here hooked up um, and uh, we're gonna stop this video right here and we're going to uh, replace these button cells like we talked about and we're going to fire it up just like it is even with these paper caps and just see if we get any noise out of the speaker and um, you never know you never know I'm pretty sure these caps probably need replaced but in a low voltage DC setting like this they're a little more they 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 tend to run a little better and don't get nearly as dried out at least that's been my experience so all right we've got the uh battery eliminator as we call it the external power supply hooked up to the a and b batteries we don't have any button cells in here we're going to try and see if we get any sound with no negative bias um the uh previous technicians that have worked on these said that they work just about as well without them so we're gonna we're gonna test that theory but i wanted you to see the inside of this speaker these are the coils we talked about and we hope that we still have decent voice coils okay so let's plug in the external power supply turn the set off actually <clears throat> I think what we'll do is we'll hook it up to the watt meter so we've got a uh, some indication even though it's just pulling the watts off of the um, transformer and this it'll give us some indication if we have any power as you can see right there we're running about four watts right now with everything turned off so let's uh let's fire it up okay no no increase in the watts all right let's check our voltages See if we have everything working correctly. B minus, okay, 63 volts. A minus, one and a half volts. Okay, we need four and a half volts. So let's see, maybe that's the C battery. Maybe we can do it with a C. Yeah, let's put the C battery on there. So we'll unplug it. And we will not use the A on this battery, on this eliminator. We will use the C. So C plus is green. There we go. And C minus is black. Okay. 
There we go. Now plug it in. 4.5 watts. Check our power here. Four and a half volts. 64 volts. Okay, close enough for jazz. And we're already powered up. So let's see, are we getting any, any tube filaments? Turn the light off here. See any tube filaments lighting up? Double check our power. That's the plate voltage. This is the tube, fil the filament voltage. Four and a half volts. Okay. All of our wires hooked up. Yep. Sounds like Sela wants to go outside, doesn't it? All right. So there we have it. We've hooked it up. And now we begin the troubleshooting process of identifying what is, uh, what's amiss might have a resistor open or either there could be a num any number of things with the fact that we don't have filament voltage on the tubes. So we'll just begin our troubleshooting. We'll begin our troubleshooting on the chassis now that we've got power and legitimate power coming out of the uh, power supply and uh, could be a bad switch even, you know. Let's flip that back and forth a few times. No, nope, not making any difference on the watt meter, as you can see. Okay, now let's do a real quick check here on the schematic of what we might be looking for. Um, we've got um, filament, voltage, four and a half volts, right here is four and a half volts, right here, comes up, goes to the filament, see, right there, and goes through the filament, drops, to two and a half volts, comes up and across, comes over to the output tube, two and a half volts to ground, 2.25 volts to ground. So the 1G, 5G tube is working off a two and a half volt or 2.5 volt filament. So we could check the, uh, the output and see if we have two and a half volts on that, and we will definitely do that. So we will have two and a half volts here, then there's two volts to this filament right here. So let's see, we come up through a 10 watt resistor, 10 W, I'll bet that's R8, 10, huh, 10 W. I'm sure it's not a 10 watt because there's no 10 watt resistors in this radio. Nope, no 10 watt resistors in here. So that might be 10 ohms. Maybe that was their old designator. I'm just looking here, 50 meg, 2 meg. Uh, let's see here, what else do we have? Oh, that, anyway, we come up through, negative through that 10 whatever resistor, R8, and go up to the filament on the detector tube in the first AF. And then um, we also come straight up through the button cells, straight up and come right over in here to four and a half volts. So we come through here and drop it to four volts through the filament, 
and then goes through that filament to two volts and comes over here to this filament, two volts. So what's, that's the first thing we'll do is we'll track down the uh, voltage on the filaments to make sure that the tubes are actually firing up. I don't see any glow on the filament, so I'm pretty sure we've either got a tube that has a filament that's open or we've got dirty tube connections and dirty uh, tube sockets, whatever. So we'll just go from there. Let me... All right, we're going to continue the repair of the Silvertone model 6150. And we're going to resume. Okay, Google, turn on the bench. Okay, turning the bench on. We're going to resume by cleaning the tubes and identifying them. And so I use glass cleaner for this. Try not to, uh, or double check to make sure it doesn't wipe off the identification etching. And there are some pretty cool tricks out there to, uh, to restore the etching. Um, I won't go into those today. You can do a Google search on vacuum tube um, identification. And let's see, we're going to use some, getting a little bit low on deoxit 100, so let's use the deoxit 5, spray the sockets, okay. Go. This is <clears throat> this is a troublemaker tube. You get that piece of uh, here we go those things are rusting on there and then these halves are kind of rusted in place but they've not been off in a while that's a Philco tube guess it could be an original and this is the one See that wear? Not sure. Pretty sure it's the uh, well, it's gone forever now, isn't it? <laughs> Usually you can breathe on it and it'll come back. 1DG, uh, 1C7G. All right, we're back to working on the Silvertone model 6150. And we uh, cleaned the tubes, cleaned the tubes up just so we could actually see the filaments when and if they ever glow. And I've hooked up the power supply here through an amp meter, a uh, Western Electric LED amp meter. And I think the amp meter works on this. I guess we'll find out in a second. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure I've ever tested that amp meter. But um, I sprayed the power switch. I think when we left before, we had talked about the possibility of the power switch not working. And also, you can see here that I've inserted a 3-volt uh, battery to take place, take the place of these two grid bias cells. These were little batteries that were inserted in under the chassis. And uh, 
very little current draw on this little battery here. This is what I uh, I was going to put into it. These are six volt. No, these are one and a half volt. And there wasn't enough room to put two of these to get three volts. So um, I just put a uh, three volt battery in there. So that's in. So let's start tracing the circuit and see if we can get anything to come through to set. Um, now that we've got everything hooked up, we've got an amp meter here. Just plug it in. And the set's already turned on. Not getting anything on the amp meter. Let's see if I can get all of this on the screen here. But rather than us piddling around with that this morning, let's uh, let's just eliminate this from the circuit since we know the voltage is not reading correctly. And uh, we'll come back to this little jewel later. We don't want to introduce any more errors into the tests, that's for sure. So let's just kind of stick that out of the way. Get that out of there. And we will... Uh, got an amp meter in here let's see here take the cover off <clears throat> set it down here there we go <clears throat> set for one amp well it says zero So zero amp. <clears throat> Let's see if we have the same thing on our 67 volt power supply. So let's uh, hook these back up. And let's just, just jump right in here. We got zero current draw on our 67. So we've got something open for sure on the chassis we need to figure out. It could be our switch is bad and it's not these <clears throat> with these leads here. If these connections, either one of these are bad, we're not going to close the circuit for the power ground so we'll check those we'll check the continuity on uh, those terminals and you can probably hear the beep here okay on a meter up above here so let's unplug the power and let's check the continuity here on the switch okay that terminal is good that terminal is good. Um, what I just checked was the continuity of these terminals and the continuity of these terminals, and they are <coughs> closed with the switch. The contacts are closed with the switch turned on. So, all right, next step is to let's just go ahead and plug the power supply in, confirm our 
get rid of this meter. Confirm our voltage. meter up above here. Let's check and see if we have 67 volts, 64 volts, close enough, and uh, minus, I mean, uh, 4.5 volts, which is what we want. <coughs> All right, so now we're going to trace this. Uh, let's just, just check and see if we actually have 67 volts um, no, let's go ahead and check and make sure we have uh, the filament voltages all the way across the uh, tube complement. So we'll hook a lead to ground here on the chassis. Let me get this back on camera. All right, this is our ground connection. And we could use a little jumper for that just to make sure that we're consistently checking ground. And anywhere on the chassis will be ground, but I'm going to go directly to the solder joint where the, the power supply switch, the switch itself goes right over here. This side of the switch goes right to chassis ground, and that's where I'm connected with the green test lead. All right, so we're going to come right down to the switch and check to see if we have four and a half volts right there on the switch. Make sure I got everything hooked up correctly here. You know, I didn't test continuity of my test leads. By the way, you've got to do that you got decent test leads or even cheapo test leads you need to check the continuity on these test leads occasionally to make sure you're not dealing with an open test lead that'll really create problems obviously okay so this test lead is good just want to make sure We should have, switch my meter back over here to volts. Okay, we should have four and a half volts on, we have uh, four and a half volts here on the, that's strange, hold on just a second here. Ground. Got four and a half volts. Let's see if we can find it here. Okay, we've got the four and a half volts coming into switch and the connection up here to we're going to come up here and check this connection where it ties into the bias cells and then goes over to the uh, oscillator tube uh, 1CG 1C7G this is the 1C7G tube and uh, there's a tie point right here on the tube and I'm getting, uh, is it turned on? Okay, it's turned on, getting 4.5 volts. Okay. Okay, I'm getting the minus 4.5 volts, which is what I'm supposed to get on that terminal. All right, so that's a good sign. And actually I did get a little tiny pop in the speaker, which was interesting. Um, but all right now let's check so we've got four and a half volts in here 
let's uh, confirm. Yeah, so we've got four and a half volts at the filament connection right here on this tube. Now, let's get on, let's check the other side of the filament and see if we have two and a half volts, 2.25 volts. And we'll jump across to the other side and we have nothing, we have zero volts. So we've got four and a half volts on one side, zero volts on the other. All right, there could be two things happening there. It could be that the filament is open on this tube. And if it is, then we're not gonna get any volt, we're not gonna get any filament voltage to the other tubes. So let's check real quick here. And let's just put this, pop this tube into the tube tester. Set the camera up for the tube tester and let's check the filament on that on this tube because we have four and a half volts at the tube but nothing on the other side of the tube zero volts so let's uh, <clears throat> just start confirming that um, we're getting a complete circuit somewhere if you'll see here it goes from two and a half volts here, comes over, goes to the output tube, to the filament, and then to ground. If this ground, if this filament is open, then that's what we would have here. There would be no current flow through this filament or this filament. So before we start pulling tubes, let's just uh, let's just check and see if we have continuity between the filament here, and we'll check the continuity on the filament of that tube. That's another quick test without pulling stuff out. So we'll go back to continuity test on the meter. And um, we've disconnected the power. Let's just see if we have uh, continuity on the filament. Okay, there's no, well, let's get a beep here. I have the correct leads no I don't grabbing the wrong lead <laughs> grab the right meter leads okay let's check the filament okay we're checking across checking across these leads right here on this tube the filament and that says that filament is open there's no beep okay all right now let's jump over to the output tube and check the filaments on the output tube which is the 1g5 and it's in this corner right over here and let's see we're looking at the same there and there. Boy, that's not good. Am I on the right terminals? There and there. No, that's not good. Don't tell me that filament is open. You know, they we've blown the tubes, blown the filaments on all of these tubes. Um, maybe somebody hooked up the. Uh, yeah, this filament is bad. If I'm getting on the right terminals, and I'm pretty sure I am, like this tube is okay, but this tube is open. So three tubes say that their filaments are open. So that's not good, but let's just double check it. Um, just pulled the grid cap. See what I did there? Just yanked the grid cap off of the tube, so I'll have to re-solder that. So let's put this in the uh, tube tester. And uh, it's this is 1C7, this tube right here. I'm 
1C7. Find it in the chart. C5, 1C7Z, wouldn't you know, not listed here, not listed in this chart, that didn't happen very often, but we know that the, uh, the filament is open on this tube. Um, you might actually be able to see it here. Yeah. See the pieces of the filament laying in the top of the tube. I get into the camera here. See the pieces of the filament is all burned up and laying in the top of the tube. Right there it is. Yeah, it's broken. So that filament's just laying around, dangling around inside the tube. All right, so let's see. I. I don't know if I have one of these. I would be very surprised if I have this tube, but we'll dig through our stuff. I don't think I have very many one volt tubes or two volt tubes, but we'll see if I have a 1C7G. All right, so that's one bad one. I'll bet you that somebody hooked up the battery power on this backwards, hooked up the 67 volt supply to the to the filament voltages and blew out all the tubes. Would not be surprised. Okay, our output tube it said the filament was open on it. And uh, let's see if we can see the filament windings. Sometimes you can actually see the filament like we just did on that one C7. Um, and you can tell if they're open or not. Uh, you can see the grids in there. I don't see the two filament. But anyway, let's just confirm that we have a open yeah yeah filament is open Ugh. one f5g oh my goodness all right i mean one g well this says one f5g and that's a one g five g and let's see what else do we have here Got another two bad here. One F seven G, and the one F seven G is the two terminals on either side of the key. All right, that filament is good. I can see, yeah, I can see the filament connection there. Um, I wonder, 1F7G is a listed in here. 1F7G, nope. No, it's not listed in my chart either because these tubes are too old. And this is an old meter up here. I might have another meter that'll have those chart, uh, those settings. And then check this last tube. I think we had confirmed that it was also blown.
wipe the I just wipe the tube identification off that one. And it is the one D five G. One D five G. This one, one D, five G. Nope, nothing on the meter. Uh, tube tester. Yeah, I can see the one D five there in the tube. Probably. Anyway, all right. So this tube is okay. Well, we know the filament's not blown on this one. If, uh, if we're reading it correctly, all right? So we've got three open filament tubes here. So we need to, we need to do some work. Let's see if we can find these tubes. Okay, well, we're not gonna get very far on this uh, repair without these tubes. And all of these filaments are open which is a shame because these are not cheap tubes and uh, somebody must must have hooked up the 67 volt power supply to the to the filament uh, circuit and blown all these one volt tubes out I'm almost certain I don't have these tubes in my stash so I'm going to have to um, to look online and see if I can find them and uh, what I'll do is if I can find the tubes in my stock or if I can find them online for not too outrageously expensive I'll go ahead and get them ordered in the meantime I'm going to go ahead and publish this um, part one video of the repair so that you get a feel for how I troubleshoot kind of was all over the place here this morning um, it's been a crazy week and so my mind is not clear this morning, but uh, you get a feel for using this external power supply and checking the voltage path, the, the signal path, or in this case, not a signal, but the voltage path. And then it leads you to make, draw all the conclusions about open filaments and all of that kind of stuff. So ordinarily with a tube set like this, I will plug it in and see if I get any filament glow and if there's no filament glow then I'll just put the tubes in the tube tester and just check them that way real quick especially if I don't have any schematic but in this case we had a schematic and we were able to trace the voltages around the set and we discovered uh, pretty quickly that three tubes have open filaments so clearly we're not going to get anywhere with that the pop in the speaker has more to do with the 67 volt supply that goes straight through the, the uh, um, speaker or voice coil. And uh, so when we would in, turn the power on, there'd be a tiny little pop. And it's because that coil is, uh, and you, the voltage through that coil is energized. It's just a tiny little pop in the speaker. Um, so um, I'm gonna clean all the bugs and larva and everything else out of this set and get this, the uh, set cleaned up a little bit and then we'll search for these tubes and we'll be back hopefully and continue our repair I also may just go ahead and replace the caps in this uh, in this thing these paper caps are notoriously bad so I may just go ahead and replace them. There's, it's not that big of a deal. I've got all the caps here to replace those paper caps. And then at least we won't have to deal with tracking down shorted caps or open caps after we get these tubes. I think I'm first gonna try to see if I can find these tubes and if I don't spend 
a fortune on them, which clearly I'm not going to put a lot of money in this little farm radio because I'll never use it once I get it fired up. But if I can get these tubes for less than 20 bucks total, <clears throat> then I'll go ahead and recap the set and, and wait on the tubes to come. So that's the plan right now. Thanks for watching Vintage Tech.